Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the mana whenua, by whose generosity we are sitting here today and living on this land. Um, yeah, it's difficult following a long line of such amazing speakers who have painted such a picture for us of our country. Yesterday, I uh, submitted a community uh, victim impact statement for sentencing of the Christchurch killer. And I was reminded sitting here today that on the day of that atrocity um, was the first attempt by our young people, our school children, to march for climate change or for policies to deal with climate change. Um, and that, that was an act of hate that day, and it's certainly not the worst act of hate that we've seen in New Zealand, given that we are a country, as many have said before today, that has dealt with colonisation, that is dealing with inequality and poverty, but the difference is that all of these things kill much more slowly. And so we don't see the impact on a single day the way that we did on 15th March 2019. What we know about acts of hate is that they're very much and very often preceded by acts of hate speech. That they happen in a climate where hate is flourishing. And... You know, that speech can happen at a micro scale in hidden chambers in the internet that are encrypted and that we don't see. And it can happen at a macro scale that desensitizes populations to the hate perpetrated against certain communities. And often in the macro space, we see that hate is fostered by states and by state actors. And that's not anything new. This is something that has happened through the ages, this notion of divide and rule, this notion of creating a common enemy to bring the majority alongside with you to show that this common enemy is threatening our way of life. I think one of the more pervasive and dangerous myths is this myth that we tell ourselves that progressives are inclusive. This tale that we tell that it's them over there that's racist, not us. And so often I hear that, oh, I I'm not like that. And it's not just racism, but other forms of discrimination. And I think it's really dangerous because the real language versus the reality, the two things are quite different. Um, and we saw one of those false dichotomies, or that, that division, that pitting of, of different things against each other today, I thought, in this notion that, that solutions to climate change and solutions to inequality have to be treated as two different things. Um, and I'm glad that that was um, responded to by um, Kevin today. Um, but because they don't have to be two different things, we don't have to treat all of our different issues as being separate. Actually, they interact and interrelate. Poverty has a colour. Poverty is racism. Very much so, which is not to say that white people don't suffer from poverty. They do. But you'll find in most of the indicators that colour is very much present. We we created this notion during lockdown of this team of five million, which was lovely, but underlying all of that, the inequality and the racism still continued. Many of you will be aware that Chinese businesses began suffering losses in February. These ideas of people not willing to sit next to anyone that looked Asian on a bus, the taunts, all of those things were still happening while we had this lovely notion of the team of five million. I've been doing some work uh, around um, online hate in terms of my involvement with the Christchurch Corps and the advisory network where I happen to be a co-chair. 
And I've recently been appointed to an international committee on the Global Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism. And both of these um, entities are responses by governments and tech companies to um, depictions of extreme violence and promotion of extreme violence and arising out of the videos and the live streaming that was shared of the Christchurch attacks. And civil society has played some role in those, but not an equal role. And I think one of, one of the concerns for me certainly is the power of global tech companies, the, the international power that they have, and the fact that the states are actually having different agendas, different laws, and they are, you know, it's very hard to have that coalition of states to counter the power of tech companies. But also, we know that states oppress. And it has been really interesting as a civil society member to see some of the states that have signed up, for example, to the Christchurch call and how they treat their own populations. And if we think that our state does not oppress its own population, then we, we have plenty of evidence before us, even if it's things like Operation 8. Um, and our submission from the Islamic Women's Council, which is available online, which goes through the way that we interacted with the state and what effect that had on us. But the question is, you know, how do we respond to hate? How do we d respond to discrimination? And for me, the project um, that I'm working on at the moment, which is the Inclusive Aotearoa Collective Tahono, is one way to respond to hate. And for me, um, I, I knew, and I think a lot of us know, that there is no quick fix to this. And what we saw in the aftermath of, of the Christchurch attacks was this urgency to do something. We needed to do something, and people were jumping on and trying to do something, but the do something was not addressing any of the root causes of the problem because there isn't a quick fix. There isn't a quick solution. You can't deliver results within six months or within a parliamentary term. That's not how these problems can be solved. So I knew that any work in this area has to have a long-term and generational focus. So what we're doing this year at the moment is developing a strategy on belonging and inclusion. And to, that, um, to do that, we've been holding conversations around the country. And I know um, we did go up to Auckland and speak to some members from Auckland um, Action Against Poverty, which was, which was really um, wonderful to be able to do. Um, as I say to many people around this work, I thought I knew my country. I thought I'd get around, I've done politics, I've done activism, I've done all sorts of things, and I try to listen to a variety of people, and I thought, you know, I'm pretty woke, I know. I know what's happening. But it just, this project has shown me my own arrogance. As we've listened to stories from people across the country, and we're only part way through our travels, I realise that I really don't know much at all about the reality of so many people's lives. I heard from people with disabilities talking about their interactions with faith communities, heard of people going to malls and having others stop, kneel, put their hands on them and pray for their recovery, heard of how they were left out of family photos because they were considered to be a mark of a sin from that the mother must have committed, or the family, or the ancestors must have committed. We heard from people with drug and alcohol addictions, the homelessness that resulted, the loss of children. One, one person who talked about having their first um, drugs given to them by a parent at around the age of 13, and drugs being sold out of that house as well as sexual abuse issues and so on. We heard from an international student who had to work the graveyard shift of a Sunday night and the constant abuse 
that she faced doing that work in a small town in New Zealand and the lack of support from the employer of any kind. But having no option to quit that work, and particularly during COVID, during lockdown, because of the need to survive. So, first of all, I would like to offer the opportunity, and please, you're welcome to come and see me afterwards or to find us online at inclusiveaotearoa.nz to join in our conversations, because the more that we can hear from everyday New Zealanders about the reality of their lives, the better that our work will be. But the next step that we'll take, once the once strategy is done, and it will be published and available publicly, is that we will be trying to develop work hubs around three main themes of the strategy. So we will have three work hubs. And for me, the importance of this is around changing the way that we work in New Zealand, and particularly in the NGO sector that is forced to compete for funding and scarce resources. It's to try and bring people together across different communities, because very often, and having myself worked in, the, in, in that sector and at the governance level, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we see that people are sticking within their own lanes, sticking to their own issues, and we aren't having that cross-sector collaboration to work on common goals. But mostly what I see is communities that are disempowered, communities that are not in charge of the way they develop, of the way that solutions are determined Often they're determined by policymakers that haven't had lived experience. They're determined by people that are removed from the reality. And I know someone else earlier today talked about that, about how communities and people within communities really have their own solutions. They know what's needed, but that isn't being heard. And for me, our work hubs are an experiment. I don't know if they are going to work well or not, but we're going to do our best. But it is really about how do we get people together, break that divide and rule stuff, create spaces where we can focus on something that we all agree on and have greater impact in the work that we do to improve people's lives. Our vision is to have 10 uh, work hubs within 10 years. Um, let's see how that goes. It's all good intentions at this point and a lot of thinking and a lot of advice and a lot of wonderful people that have come forward to support us. So thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. Really appreciate that. Kia ora. Um, Nga mihi moto generosity. You know, the generosity and the koha of your whakaro and kōrero now and the heaviness of the mahi that you do and that you hear about. To start off, you know, um, when we think about the white supremacist terrorist attack that happened on March 15th last year, and um, that was the murder of 51 um, Fano from the Muslim community in New Zealand, to the rhetoric of our response as a country that um, they are us. And I'm going to call a little bit of bullshit on that stuff because the white supremacy, as you say, doesn't exist in an individual. It exists in you know, our colonial state and the way that we are structured in the conversations that we allow to happen. So there's mahi for all of us. I just want to thank you for... Um, for I've not heard you speak before, and I was really... Uh, I don't know. I hate to be a bit patronising, but inspired by your call. It also mahi atu kia, 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 kia,